Dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. I do hope you're safe, whatever you are. Big thanks to ITU for bringing all of us together today to speak about closing the digital gender gap. Um, we'll be speaking a lot about this topic, so please do not hesitate to drop your questions, your comments in the chat, the interactive live chat that you're seeing on your screen, and let's get going. Thank you so much for being with us today. So, well, we already know that SDG 9 commits governments to strive to achieve affordable, universal internet access. However, high costs are keeping billions offline, and women who are, who are earning almost 20% less than men globally in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, earn on average 48% less than men, these women are being more impacted by costs to connect and as, as a result face also limited digital opportunities. So worldwide is estimated that approximately 250 million fewer women than men are online. We are talking about a country like the size of Brazil just not being online. So Internet user penetration, according to uh, the, the, the ITU in the globe, is 12% lower for females than males. This gap between the two rates goes up to 31% in the least developed countries. $18 billion, and I repeat here, $18 billion could be added to the global GDP if women were as active as men in the digital sector. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my question to you. Are we failing at implementing efficient, fast-paced and tailored intervention to the realities of these different countries? Should we call this perhaps some sort of a uh, lottery of birth? Some believe that where you're born will define your future, your opportunities. And in this case, we will define also your level of internet and ICT access as well, I suppose. So my name is Anna Mori. I work for the She Trades, the International Trade Centers Initiative, which aims to connect 3 million women to markets by 2021. I'm also a member of the Equals Partnership, multi-stakeholder partnership with a goal to close this digital gender divide by 2030. So today we hope to provide you with some concrete ways to ensure women have access to equal access to online resources, as well as that they are able to seize digital opportunities. Without any longer, I'd like to introduce you dear audience to our distinguished panelists who will help us understand basically what needs to be done. All right. So are you there with me all panelists? Let me check if I have all of you here, if Francis is online. I hear some background noise, so for not off your microphone. Wonderful, thank you so much. So let's start with my first question goes to Aida Nganga. She's the president of Women in STEM Network and, in, and it's Women in International Artificial Intelligence Africa Network, Regional Consortium of Experts for Development and Regional Head UNESCO Emerging Technologies for Development. Basically, she wears many other hats as well. And I would need, I think, another 10 minutes to do justice to your biography, uh, Ida. Welcome, Ida. Very happy to have you here today. So the very word pandemic means pertaining to all people. However, we know that this crisis highlighted that indeed we are in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. Partnership mm -hmm. collaboration are much needed now. So in your opinion, which stakeholders should be mobilized for women in tech uh, to, to basically to foster, right? Women in tech social economic transformation and why? What's the role of, you know, of, of these stakeholders in empowering women uh, in tech? So the, the floor is yours. Set the scene for us, Ida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, that's a great, great question. And actually, it's um, a great way to lead in this conversation because this is some of the things that women in tech do not seem to be aware of. They seem to be aware of the challenges in their own areas, in the work that they do, in the kind of um, people they are trying to mobilize in their own specific 
small areas or sectors. But when it comes to engaging other stakeholders, there seems to be and this is something which needs to be addressed because women in tech need to understand that there are decisions that are made that are not within their own circles. So this, in other words, just means there are other people who are there that we can engage in order to productively set the agenda and move forward. And some of these are policymakers. ITU, having organized this session, I think has done an incredible job. I think it just shows us that there are people who are willing to aid women in this journey or in this war, because some people say it's actually a war. But that is very okay, because all it means is that women are positioning themselves in order to go forward forward and they're not going to go forward by themselves. So that is a win. When it comes to uh, policymakers, it becomes um, a bit of a challenge for women who have not engaged policymakers before, because women might be on the front line of their own areas, but they may not, they may not understand that policies are there to aid them in order to set their agenda forward. So when it comes to meetings being run in your own country, the first thing that I always say is you need to know who are the people who are making policies in your own country, even before you go regional or international. You need to know who they are, be it the ministries of ICT and innovation, be it ministries that are dealing with other areas such as gender and development, be it communications authorities in your own country, be it other bodies or agencies such as innovation agencies that have been set up specifically to deal with matters of ICT development and um, gender inclusion. So when you take an agenda forward, you cannot just run it in your own sector or in your own area. Those women or those uh, people you are always with already understand the issues. You have to take the issues to where policy will be affected or can be informed. And that is what we are discussing here today, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aida. I totally agree with you. It's a lot about crafting the correct policies to, to give the, the, the equal access to women and girls to, to, to use uh, internet, ICTs, technologies, and digital, but it's also about making sure these information on the policies are, uh, are accessible for such women and girls that sometimes might not even uh, be aware of the policies and programs that they could benefit from. So. Thank you so much for your first comment. Um, and we'll get back to this point. You have a lot to share. But for now, I'd like to move on to our next dear panelist of the day. Uh, her name is Zara Nazari, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, Zara is the board member at Afghanistan Telecommunication Regulatory Authority. She's also the associate professor at computer science faculty of Kabul Polytechnic University. She has a degree in computer engineering and master's in information engineer and a PhD uh, by the University of Ryukyu's Japan. What an honor to have you with us today, Zara. And uh, I just want to confirm if you, if you can hear us, if it's all is set, you're online, wonderful. So please tell us a little bit about the situation of women in tech in your country, in Afghanistan. In your opinion, what are the, the main challenges you are facing to improve the role of Afghan women in, in technology? Later on in the conversation, we'll bring you back to talk about the best practices. But right now I'd like to know in your opinion, what are the main challenges you're facing to improve the, the, the role of women in, in Afghanistan, the, the role of women in tech um, in Afghanistan? The floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy uh, that uh, I'm here virtually with you. And uh, thank you for introducing me to other dear panelists of this program. Uh, I'm living, in, I'm living in Afghanistan, and uh, you know that uh, we are facing uh, a very long uh, civil war. And uh, as you said before, uh, the number of, unfortunately, there, there are very few women who are entrepreneurs around the world, and especially in my country, Afghanistan. And I think uh, this situation uh, is mainly due to a gender gap in STEM education. Uh, the most important challenges that uh, we are facing in Afghanistan are wrong family expectations and uh, stereotypes, uh, uneducated parents, uh, cultural issues, teachers' capacity, 
old school curricula, lack of digital skills and a lack of safe learning environment for girls. But uh, recently, the government of Afghanistan has started to develop policies and strategic plans to, to improve girls, uh, uh, girls' education and participation in STEM. Uh, because now we believe that uh, providing equal access to STEM education and ultimately STEM careers for girls and women is an imperative uh, from the human rights scientific and development perspectives. Uh, for example, uh, we are about uh, we are about to, to launch a national pro a national uh, program named Coding for Girls uh, that will improve coding skills as well as uh, other digital skills that are required for women and girls in a school and college level. And also, we are trying to increase the number of girls in uh, engineering and tech fields in universities. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, when I was a student, uh, maybe we were around six or seven girls in a class. But uh, recently, uh, because I'm teaching, uh, recently I see that um, around half of the class population are girls and uh, we're very happy that uh, this happened. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Zara, for your for your contribution. It's very good to know from the from the government side what has to be done. You spoke, you touched on on very important points about also some um, cultural aspects, but also uh, this gender gap in, in STEM uh, yeah. subjects as well, as well as teachers' capacity um, to deliver such training. Right now, since the world, because of the pandemic, is moving towards online um, education, is really the, the right moment that we are bringing all of us together here to see how we can create these partnerships or access curriculums that are available in other countries so we do, do not need to replicate and do uh, double work uh, where we, we still need to develop in, in some areas, which is pretty much everywhere. But um, thank you so much for your, um, your intervention. We'll get back to uh, your point on the specific best practices that your government is doing, such as the Coding for Girls um, initiative. But for now, I would like to bring all the speakers to uh, briefly uh, speak on the topic. I'm moving, and I think it's just a perfect flow. I'm moving to a uh, private sector now with Lindsay Nefesh Clark. And uh, my next question is about, let me first introduce Lindsay properly. Lindsay is the founder and CEO of W4.org, a social enterprise dedicated to girls and women's empowerment with a focus on promoting their equal access to and participation in ICTs. She has previously worked for Human Rights Watch, UNICEF, on Fondasi, and many other organizations. So we are really talking with a, a passionate woman entrepreneur in gender and tech. So Lindsay, welcome. Um, what would you say, and picking up from what Zara has mentioned already, um, what would you say that are some of the best practices that can be leveraged to encourage girls and women to pursue tech studies and tech careers? That could be employees of big companies in tech as well as uh, entrepreneurs in tech. So tell us a bit of these best practices in your experience. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And many thanks to the ITU for bringing us together to discuss this crucial topic at this critical time. And Anna, thanks for driving the urgency of this issue home. Um, you know, there's so much at stake when we discuss women in technology. Uh, the pandemic has really underscored the urgency of closing the digital divide and the digital gender divide. So, so we have to get this right. Well, the good news is um, we know what the barriers are that are holding girls and women back. And we have myriad solutions and best practices and excellent recommendations and roadmaps. Just as there are multiple interrelated barriers, as Ida underlined, so we need to mobilize all stakeholders, from families and school to the government and corporate and civil sectors. We need ambitious government strategies backed up with budgets and investments, and we need metrics and accountability. 
obviously, and as you, you said, Anna, we need to ensure girls and women's access to affordable infrastructure and technologies, including broadband access. Then there's the challenge of adequate education. And as Zara, you compellingly explained, we must invest more in digital skills education and upskilling with curricula that are free from gender discrimination, unconscious bias and dissuasive stereotypes. We need to boost girls and women's self-confidence. You know, we have to make tech an attractive proposition. And we can do that through real world learning opportunities and raising girls' awareness of the truly vast and exciting career options. And we need mentors and more visible, relatable role models. And all of this can help to, to shift men's side, mindsets, excuse me. But of course, um, that's the external pipeline. Corporates must fix the worrying attrition of women in tech. Um, you know, how? Well, with more transparent recruitment and HR policies addressing unconscious bias, including uh, bias in AI, um, by harnessing, mentoring, networking, sponsorship, and implementing policies to promote more women to senior technical and leadership positions and to foster um, a more inclusive company culture and environment. So, you know, there really is so much we can do. Um, what, what gives me hope is to see uh, cross-sector collaboration in our work at W4, um, from DR Congo to Pakistan to Cambodia and Nepal. We're collaborating with schools, companies, and relevant government sectors to implement adapted digital skills training for girls and women and to foster women's tech-based entrepreneurship. And in this regard, I would really like to salute the work and leadership of the ITU and Equals for pushing this urgent issue up the global agenda and for mobilizing partners from across all sectors to work collaboratively to, to address this issue. Thank you. Very powerful intervention. I really like how practical you got with some, you know, uh, strategies and, and, and tricks on how we can uh, actively improve access to internet and digital solutions to uh, women and girls. And uh, before I move on to the next question, I would like to, to invite the audience as well to drop your questions in the chat. Very soon we'll be picking up some of those to ask to our dear panelists. But moving on now, and thank you so much, Lindsay, for bringing such a practical perspective that is much needed. I am going to ask a question to the next, the fourth speaker of today, um, Silvina Moschini. She is the founder and president of Transparent Business, a platform that manages remote teams. And she's also the CEO and founder of She Works, a marketplace for hiring professional women with flexible models. She won the 2019 Equals in Tech Award. So, Silvina, welcome. You are a uh, truly innovator and uh, believes that we should challenge the, the status quo to include more women in the digital world, right? So tell us why is it important to accelerate models where women can combine both professional and personal life? And I would love to hear a little bit about what you do having such a strong uh, platform that does exactly that. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. Thanks the ITU and my fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And there is one simple answer to that. It's because women mean business. It's not a matter of feeling sorry for us because we have been left behind, behind because we are paid less, because we have less opportunities than men. Today, women accomplish more advanced degrees, masters, doctorates, and bachelor's degree than men, yet have been left behind. When women start businesses, the fact for them is extremely, extremely limited. Just to give you some numbers, only 2.0, all the total capital from venture capitalists go to female entrepreneurs. This is absurd. When women run businesses, their businesses are much more profitable. So what we do and what we do here, and just by the way, I hacked the financial system and I became the first woman in running a unicorn. We call it 
a female unicorn because it's the first unicorn run by a woman who didn't go through VCs. I appeal to people because I do believe when we work together, we are much more powerful. So I second all my co-panelists here in the concept that we all need to work together with ourselves, with public sector, with private sector. And what we do at SheWorks is to basically connect the dots between the talents of the opportunity. I was inspired by two companies. One was Match.com because I met my husband in Match, but also and Match.com for those that don't know is a site where you can find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But I also was inspired by Amazon. And when we have technology and the amazing power of the internet, we can connect the talent that is absolutely universal with the opportunities that are not. And we do believe that one thing that COVID left us as a silver lining is the opportunity to understand that the work is something that you do, not somewhere that you go to. If we have internet, we can have access to the training that we need, no matter where we are, to develop the skills that the global market needs. If we have internet, we can have jobs that fits into women's life. And when I say job that fits into women, I'm thinking about the 51% with kids that leave the workforce because of lack of flexibility. When we're living in the digital age, lack of flexibility is absolutely a nonsense. We cannot afford not have flexible work models. We cannot afford leaving women behind. So at SheWorks, what we do is to create a marketplace in which we work with NGOs, with educational institutions, with governments, and with companies to tell the companies that they say that they are super committed to gender inclusion to actually have the opportunity to make the women visible for them so they can hire with no excuses. Because sadly, there are many companies that say that they are committed, but yet women are still being left behind. So this is what we do and we hope that we will now with a status of Unicornia enable women from all over the world to connect with job opportunities where these opportunities are. Silvina, thank you so much. Really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Can you just tell me where you're based right now? Based so, in Miami. Based in Miami. And your platform operates in which country right now? United States or? Absolutely globally. The platform is uh, internet based. So we have women representing over 121 countries. And it's a uh, tech power. So we have clients that can range from countries such as Argentina, my home country, to uh, Saudi Arabia, where we work a lot with Saudi talent uh, remotely, enabling women in the kingdom to export their services without even having to, well, no one is moving from, from their homes in many countries now, but without having to limit themselves to the local opportunities. Wonderful. So we have already a, a first uh, example and a good platform for those women and uh, women entrepreneurs or self-employed women that want to to find uh, a potential uh, business partner. So please uh, check she works out. And thank you so much. I really like the point that you mentioned on access to finance and how women really suffer because they tend to have also smaller businesses, less collateral when they go to 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 request uh, bank loans and 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 also less uh, understanding in, in financial management. So there are some challenges there. Indeed, is a need is a topic that needs uh, an ecosystem behind. Uh, to move us forward and finance is extremely important. So now moving to um, our, well, last but not least um, speaker is uh, Francis Kubahiro. Can you confirm that you're online? Can you mute yourself? Thank you so much. Francis, my question, let me introduce you first, right? Uh, I feel that I already uh, know you, um, but the audience does not. So he graduated as a telecommunications and computer engineer certified in the Internet of Things and many other things. Uh, currently, Francis is the director of ICT Infrastructures and ITU National Focal Point. He's also Burundi's National IGF Focal Point and Equals National Focal Point. Um, very happy to see a, a male face in the conversation today. This is very much needed. So Francis, would you like to share with us some, some best practices undertaken by your government to improve women in technology to help their access to digital solutions and basically inspire us um, 
Francis. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you all. You hear me? Okay, thank you, thank you very, very, very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as you say, the Anna Mori, uh, since uh, two years ago, I have been appointed uh, as a ECOS national focal point. And indeed, in our Africa, uh, I mean, especially in our region, the, the main challenge we are facing is the culture. We have many, many women, talented uh, uh, PhDs in, in ICT, academia, but most of the time they are seen that mother not take women. So what we did, uh, firstly, it was not to, 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 to ensure that women are included, firstly, in a high liver position, I mean, most of the time, when we, it was about to, for voting budget, for example, most of the time we are women, no, we are men. So what we did, it was to, to include also women, to sensitize women, and also to make so what we called uh, in French, réseau de femmes, what means is uh, networking, ICT women networking, high levels one. And uh, for me, it was, uh, I mean, it was a very easy because my minister was, uh, was a woman and my chief director was a woman, IT. So it was very, very easy to, 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 to start those small projects with women software, software developers, for example. And as I mentioned two years ago, we, 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 we did for the first time in our country what we call the Miss Technology. And the Miss Technology, it was bring women, I mean, to combine the beauty, but also the, the brain to show that the women, they are beauty, but also the women, they are things. This is a key, key thing you have to understand because uh, most of people who came in, in, our, in, our, in our countries, there is some different approaches. And the most of people that are living in rural areas, even if within in, uh, many cities, I mean, in the urban areas, there is a gap, uh, I mean, discrimination to, for women to, to reach those opportunities that ICT can bring. And they, so can you imagine in rural areas, they are where people, they are very, 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 very conservative. So what we did, it was firstly, and I mean, in terms of policies, is to initiate projects in the high schools. Most of those schools are located in rural areas. And then we mentioned that all, pro all programs, of ICT programs, we have to have 50-50, men and women. It was a big goal to, to, to achieve, and then we did it. So now in all high schools in, in my country, rural areas, we have what we call club they say in French, I mean the ICT club. ICT club. And the most of those ICT club, they are running by women. I mean, they are young, young ladies. It was uh, one of what we achieved, the difficulty, but now it's what we call in French, a key. That means that is there. And the, every year we have a small budget for that activity and the government when they saw when they have seen the, the the result we had a good feedback from the prime minister office and even if even if also for our state house the presidency house they saw the report we made they say congratulations so i can say that we have been victim of our success because they came in our ministry to say okay you have to generalize all those uh, uh, programs. And then we said, okay, it's okay, but we, we are facing budget issue. But for me, it was a, a, a good achievement because the sensibilization of, is uh, one of things is, I think is very, very important. And uh, secondly, when we had a, 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 a university service found, I have, I fight again in order to include in the director for boards of this, this uh, 
Universal Business Fund, what is a huge amount, there was no women inside. And now the vice president of uh, the Universal Service Fund is my chief. So what is very, very good for me because now we have planned for three or uh, two or three years to come, many, many projects because she, she was on the decision makers. She's the vice president of uh, the, that uh, university found. This one, this one also in terms of policies is what I, I can call, um, excuse me, I'm French, I'm French people, is, in French you call it anarchy, what it means is something that we have it and is writing somewhere. And what we are doing also is to draft a policy called, if I can translate it, is a, a women and men engage, no, no, men engage to women in ICT. So we are drafting it. You know, it's very complicated because we have to involve the many ministers because we have a minister of gender. But the priority of minister of gender is not necessarily ICT. They have many problems. You see? We have to bring first the women in the schools. We have to women to to give a good education, health, and the, and so and so. Uh, but because of what I said, my minister went to see her colleagues. They say you have to include ICT approach in the, all your projects. So we are drafting uh, this project. This uh, it, it will it will be a law. So because when something is in law everyone has to do, has to follow. But if something is all a recommendation, I mean, when there is a cabinet minister's, minister's uh, meeting, they can give a, a, a recommendation, but that can take a time to be implemented. But when it's a law adopted by parliament, it is a must for everyone. So just briefly is what we are, is what we, we are doing. And also, what I can say is that the COVID, the, this COVID, uh, this COVID pandemic also uh, stopped many, many of our events. We have organized a regional event to. to, is, to we, we are we are getting there. We are continuing with the. Okay. My other okay. question to you later on will be exactly what's the future for women in tech. But for now, let's park this. Thank you so much for your contribution so far. It was very Thank important you. for us Thank to. You. To, to really understand what you uh, actually it reinforced what we mentioned before right that in every country uh, women need of course more and more to access and opportunities to access uh, digital solutions however and the issues are the same everywhere but the list of priority issues might differ from country to country so your point that you made uh, in, in bringing in changing the mindset right of government of the population in 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 working at the cultural level awareness raising is extremely important i'm very proud of the the ict clubs that you uh you mentioned that is present in the high schools very practical as well the miss technology and all and all that i think many of us that are listening that are tuned in in this in this discussion today and other government officials that might be listening will come back to you to learn about what you're what you're doing uh, in Burundi. So, but for now, uh, just in order, you know, to keep track of our time, because uh, we unfortunately have one only one hour scheduled for today's uh, session. I would like to go to our uh, second phase of today's conversation. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear for everyone that is tuned in the discussion today. So please drop your questions in the live chat. I'm here uh, collecting um, some some of them. Some of them. And right now, I would like to. There is one question for Lindsay. You there with us? Continue, of course. <laughs> of course. So, <laughs> yes, wonderful. So, um, what we wanted to know from you is, what can we do better to promote women's tech-based entrepreneurship? And what's what what exactly is w uh, w4.org doing that could be beneficial for our listeners? I think they want to learn more from from your uh, perspective. Okay, thank you, Anna. Excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, um, I just want to uh, preface my comments with we know, um, as Sylvina was saying, we know the opportunities of investing in um, women's digital entrepreneurship are immense. Um, 
you know, there's another important point. So we, we, there are all these headline grabbing, you know, the, the economic figures that we can, we can capture if we increase women's participation in the economy, in uh, formal employment, um, also as, as entrepreneurs, and that's great. Um, but there's a point I also want to, to emphasize is, you know, we also know that women's increased participation in the economy correlates positively to wider development gains. Um, so, so it's also about um, ensuring um, in inclusive, sustainable development. That's a, um, and arguably this entire conversation we could say extends to women's participation in the economy when you look that the future of jobs will require digital skills. Now to come to the subject of digital entrepreneurship, I would uh, completely agree with Sylvina that um, we, um, you know, we, we clearly need to do more and better to create an enabling ecosystem. And one persistent barrier is um, obviously um, access to, to funding. I mean, right here in Europe, women make up only 19% of ICT, ICT entrepreneurs. And um, according to the European Commission, 93% of capital invested in European companies last year went to all male founding teams. Well, that's just not good enough. Um, um, maybe to strike a more positive note, as if where you know where there are initiatives that are hopefully moving things, is we also saw last year the introduction of the Women in Digital Scoreboard, which is monitoring women's participation in the digital economy. Um, nevertheless, um, we seriously need to address um, this issue of access to fin financing for women entrepreneurs, both in the public and in the the, the you know in terms of public funding and private funding addressing biases, market failures. Um, and we, we need to see more gender lens investing. We need to invest more in women digital entrepreneurs. Um, another point I'd like to make about that before maybe I mention what we're doing at W4 is also, you know, the other factors that we tend to call soft factors that I think should not be underestimated, role models, women role models, women entrepreneurs, digital entrepreneurs, the world is full of them. Um, the the Global Entrepreneurship Monitoring Report has underlined though, and I think this is very important, we have to be careful not to narrowly focus on these high tech, high growth uh, companies and entrepreneurs, and also recognize the huge and important contribution of uh, trailblazing women, um, uh, tech entrepreneurs in the small and medium sized enterprises. I think that's, that's really important. Um, and just to you know, close with regard to W4, well, W4, we, as I said earlier, we implement um, IT skills training ranging from digital literacy right the way through to specialized, you know, specialist ICT skills training and also um, entrepreneurship training. And we also propose crowdfunding um, because we're, women are not going to wait. I loved what you said, Sylvina, we mean business. So we're not going to wait. So, okay, well, crowdfunding can be a source of financing. And so we're, we're rolling up our sleeves and we're out there uh, trying to trying to make a difference L listening to you is like an injection of motivation uh lindsay thank you so much i want everyone that is there with a good it uh, it project a woman entrepreneur willing to get uh finance to go and, and and drop your project to see if lindsay's team can help you crowd uh fund your 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 dreams in your in your business right so thank you so much very uh useful intervention um, now we have a question uh, from the chat. It's by Akia, if I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Um, and perhaps I'm going to, let me see, I'm going to direct this question to either Aida or uh, Silvina. Uh, she's saying that there are still some, there are still out there some software companies that are not interested to take women as a programmer. How can we change this scenario? You can please be very, very brief. Tell us like one, two, three, or only one, whatever you have in mind. Thank you. Either you wanna go ahead or shall I start? Either way. You could go ahead, Silvina. Okay. Well, as, um, as I said, like many more companies need to put their money where their mouth is. There are many companies saying that they wanna hire women engineers. There are many women engineers around the world. Perhaps they are not just living in Silicon Valley in the headquarters of many of the big firms, but now with remote work, this shouldn't be a problem because as we said, like they can be hired 
anyone, uh, anywhere, and they can be brought into the workforce just with a click. If we have internet, we can connect that. So I think one thing to do is to um, encourage them to embrace not uh, only during the COVID, but beyond uh, beyond COVID, the possibilities that the internet is bringing to them, and work with companies to push them to have more diverse teams. I think that they will see when they started to create, as Lindsay said, this inclusive culture, because many times it is a topics club where the guys are leaving the women behind because it's hostile environment. They just you know, do their things and we don't let us participate. So we need to fake it, fake it till we make it. So we need to create an, an environment in the companies in which just by pushing, we, become, we make it become the norm and this will happen because when they see that they can have the point of view of the significant part that makes 80% of the purchase decisions in the world, they will see how much better, how better they can do. And in times of change, as we saw, the best countries that handle the pandemic were handled by were those countries that have women leadership, empathic, inclusive, diverse, communication driven and emotional intelligence driven teams perform significantly better. I think it's just a matter of like faking fake it till we make it and pushing to get the norm, to make it the new normal to have women in the workforce. Thank you so much, uh, Silvina. I will go to Ida now, if you have a comment. Yeah, I have a comment. Um, Anna, we, women, I think we need to be more um, active. It's one thing to say that women are not being hired by these software companies, but how engaged are we? Remember, software companies are one of the stakeholders that I was talking about. It wasn't only government, it's also the private sector. It means that there are many programs being run out there by the tech community. We need to be part of those tech communities. For me, it took so long. I was part of every tech community out there. I was going for hackathons. I was going for meetups. I was so engaged, they knew my name. So you cannot sit at home and say that you're waiting to be hired when you are not actively engaging in the community's activities. So women, we need to be out there. Let's build our skill sets. They are going to be seen. And this is where the hiring process becomes very easy. It's not even a matter of lobbying. You're automatically one of the best candidates. Thank you. I think governments should hire you, Silvina and Aida. Uh, if they want to really increase the participation of women in tech companies and push this uh, through the throats of, uh, of, of business companies, multinationals and all that. You're a great advocate and I totally agree with all of your points. Um, we have, well, we, we need to wrap up in, in, in some minutes, but we still have some, some, some time. I would like to now uh, make a quick question and, and quick reaction, please, to... Um, Zara and uh, Francis, both representing two, two countries where I can see that the government is really pushing um, the promoting women in, in technology. So if you could tell us in, in, in a few words, what's the future look like for them? Do you see that in five years, things will be much better? Do you think that now with COVID, um, we were forced to accelerate that? So what's the, what's, what does the future look like? For women in tech in a very nutshell maybe francis and then zara thank you thank you very much i think uh, i'm agree of what uh, i have uh, i have heard from ida and the Sidiana. if i'm going to from the comment of madame ida i think she's true she's right women you have to be more aggressive you know because market is very aggressive because just to give you my case one of the piona in my country uh, she's a woman the piona in the intelligent artificial very very smart women but no one knows and the, one of the it in, the, in our private second bank she's a woman and she was a friend of, of, of my, my sister and i told her no one knows what we are doing because she told me for the three last years, she can take a leave because even if she, she last, last time she, take, she, she took a leave in Dubai, she came quickly because everything was going down and she was one of the, she, she had a PhD in the programmer. But I told her, no one knows. So I think 
the women, you have to be very, very aggressive because the, the market is very, very aggressive. This is one. The second one, I think in, in, in my country, I think I'm very, very optimist uh, because of we are doing quickly. Is what I, I, I said to, to my minister. I said, you have to be quickly. Now people, they understand you. You have to be quickly to push those policies documents to be adopted very quickly because now we are in the beginning of uh, the, 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 the new mandatory in French. I mean, because uh, we, we had a new election. So now we have a new government, you know. So I told her, because in one year, there's many, many uh, priorities, because now the, the, the president, uh, she, 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 he's trusting you. So please make, make many things. And then we push the parliament so to, to be adopted quickly. And the budget also, when we are adopting a budget, budget also include those, those projects. And uh, I think everything is, is, go, is, go, is, go, is going good. Despite this COVID, is what I, I was saying. Because this COVID, we, we want to, to organize a national one women event. I think if we organize this one, every every month, everybody will be sensitized. And uh, and also, I would like to, to thank you because the ITU is give us a, a very very good. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean. Last time, I think Madame Loli and Kara, we, we, we have launched a, a good project, and they, they had the two ministers, and they said it's okay. Francis, now I have to you. sorry, right. thank you so much. I need to allow yes. to interrupt the other speakers. I know we have a lot, lot to share. Thank you so much. Very briefly, coming to to Zara, and I'll ask actually um, Zara if you could tell us. Um, basically the same question, right? What's next for women in tech in Afghanistan? So in a nutshell, where you, if you compare to where you are right now, where you see uh, the situation for women in tech in five years? I know it's uh, a tough question, but... Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as you said before, uh, during the COVID-19, uh, most of the countries that they, that they didn't have uh, online learning or e-learning, they were forced to have the e-learning to launch the online learning and uh, Afghanistan also we did uh, this and uh, uh, fortunately I see I saw that uh, uh, ladies, uh, girls, women, they were much more active than uh, guys and uh, uh, also, we are we are trying to um, building the teachers' uh, capacities. Also, we are uh, trying to remove the gender bias from learning materials, and uh, we are also pr uh, promoting positive images of uh, women in STEAM through the media, and uh, much more activities that uh, I, I cannot remember right now. But uh, I see a bright, uh, very bright future. Uh, for the Afghan girls in tech and uh, maybe in a very near future, maybe five years later or 10 years, uh, after 10 years, we can have uh, at least uh, 25 or 30 percent participation uh, in the tech market. And wow. uh, yeah, I, like I, market. Yeah. I hope it's a commitment. Huh? <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. But no. I see I see a very bright future. Thank you, Zara. Thank you. It's, it's, it's indeed, um, I, I do agree with you and uh, the stakeholders that are present in the call. I think we should continue the discussion also yeah. you know, and help each other. There's a lot of content there. There's a lot of policymakers, uh, 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 strategic panelists, experts here. So we need to continue the discussion. We are wrapping up. So now uh, what I would like from you and before actually asking that, I agree with Francis when you mentioned that um, Women need to be bold, they need to be more aggressive, safe networks and a good environment for them to be able to speak out. It must be ensured by uh, uh, policymakers as well. And one comment from the chat, which is very important, is that we need more ICT policymakers that are female, because right now men are crafting the policies in ICT in those countries. So this is another important comment from the chat. Now I'd like to ask uh, Silvina, if you could give us your concluding statements, 30 seconds for you only, Silvina. I'm so sorry because we are running out of time. A concluding remark. I think that COVID-19 gave us the best opportunity for women of our times. It will enable us to access the knowledge that we need to develop the skills that will help us to become employable at the global scale. 
and also will bring the opportunities. So as my colleague says, we just need to do it. We just need to make it happen. We just need to be brave and aim for the sky because now with internet and with technologies that connect the dots between the talent and the opportunities, for us, the sky is the limit. Thank you, Silvina. Wonderful. Now, same 30 seconds for uh, Francis. 30 seconds, Francis. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for all. I think uh, we have to, to make things change. To, we have to make change. Uh, we have to make things happen. That, that's uh, our, our slogan now in our, in our ministry adopted. Make everything, make, bring everybody together and uh, make, uh, make, make changes coming and make everything good happen. And I uh, thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Francis. Let's take this discussion that we are having here and put in practice because we already know what to do, right? So, yes, Ida, 30 you. seconds for you, Ida. Thank you. Concluding statement. Okay, yeah, for me, I would say that uh, we need to demand for actionable ways forward and measurable strategies and in interventions from the stakeholders, be it government, be it civil society, be it academia and beat the innovators um, ecosystem. It is your right to hold them accountable. Gone are the days when citizens were on the sidelines of the development agenda. Women in tech are, gro are global and national citizens and they must not take their participation lightly. Thank you. Thank you, very powerful, the ecosystem message. Now Zara, 30 seconds for you, for your concluding remarks. Zara, are you with us? Zara, can you hear us? Okay, so in the meantime, Lindsay, if you'd like to share with us your concluding remark, remarks in 30 seconds. Thank you. Yeah, um, as other panelists have said, I mean, the pandemic has really thrown into relief uh, the urgency of closing the digital gender divide. Um, I'd say as we aim to, to, to build back be better, we urgently need to close the digital gender divide. Um, women remain alarmingly underrepresented across the entire IT ecosystem globally. Um, and tech is shaping everything, the societies and economies we live in and the values. So this is an urgent issue. I think my one last urgent plea would be for everyone to get involved in the equals global movement, given how high the stakes are. And, and let's contribute the financial resources and the other resources we need uh, to turn the situation around. Wonderful. Now, please, Zara, if you could give us your 30 seconds final remarks. Okay, sorry. Uh, just, uh, I, first of all, I thank ITU for uh, organizing such a program. And uh, uh, for my country, I have to say that uh, we need the, uh, how can I say the cooperation and the support of international communities like uh, uh, ITU, UNESCO, and uh, other uh, international uh, organizations to support uh, Afghan women. And also we are trying as a government entity, we are trying to make uh, good policies uh, to have uh, uh, to have um, much more ladies in uh, in how can I say in the market tech market and uh, once again thank you very much thank you so thank you so much everyone we know that this digital transformation is really happening right now COVID has pushed us to move faster when it comes to learn when it comes to work when it comes to produce when it comes to deliver online and given that 95 percent of all new jobs We'll have a digital component. We need to act right now. We need to ensure that women have the skills and, and opportunities in the digital economy. I hope we all, by we, I mean myself, I mean all the speakers here today, all these amazing experts have managed to provide you with some recommendations today. And it's, it's have been a pleasure to moderate such uh, incredible panel. Thanks to ITU for bringing us all together today. And the discussion doesn't end here. So please feel free to reach out to us to schedule virtual coffees afterwards. Thanks for your time. And with that, uh, thanks to all of you. I close the session. Thank you so much and have a lovely day, afternoon or evening.